So it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's translational neuroscience seminar, Dr. Sashin Patel. Um, Sashin obtained his MD PhD at the Medical College of Wisconsin before completing a residency training program in psychiatry at Vanderbilt. Um, he's currently an endowed professor, uh, the director of the Division of General Psychiatry and the director of the Research Track Residency in Psychiatry at Vanderbilt. Ashton's probably best known for his, his contributions to our understanding of the cannabinoid system um, and its role in the brain's response to stress and um, drug abuse, uh, largely focusing within the, the basolateral, central, and extended amygdala. His lab has also made some critical insights into um, the cellular and synaptic physiology of endocannabinoid signaling and really has been at the forefront of investigating this system as a potential therapeutic target. It's a real privilege to have him visit with us today um, through the magic of the internet. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Sashin. All right, great. I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen. All right, Roger, does that look okay? That's good. All right, great, thank you. Well, thanks so much for the, the kind introduction and um, finally making this happen. We were postponing, looking forward to the, the chance of coming to New York, but um, we'll have to do that another time, I, I hope in the not, not too distant future. Um, so I'm gonna spend the next 45, 50 minutes or so talking about work that um, we've been doing on understanding the role of cannabinoid signaling systems um, and its implications for uh, anxiety and stress-related disorders, and then also some recent work we've been doing um, in the addiction space focusing on uh, alcohol use uh, disorder. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, so these are just some uh, disclosures. None of them are, are uh, relevant to work I'll be presenting, and there are no conflicts related to the data that I'll present. So I'm focusing um, for the first few minutes to get everyone on the same page um, about what cannabis is and a little bit about some of the epidemiology that got us interested in trying to understand endocannabinoids and their relationship to stress-related disorders um, and some of the underlying biology, and then talk about two projects. Um, the first one, um, as Roger mentioned, has really been the focus of our lab for many years now. And that is understanding the role of a particular cannabinoid signaling molecule, tuarachidonyl glycerol, and how it regulates anxiety and fear responses and some of the neural and circuit mechanisms by which this signaling system uh, can affect these processes. And then in the second part, um, I will touch a little bit on some new data, um, trying to understand how modulation of 2-AG signaling uh, might be used therapeutically um, in substance use disorders, again, focusing on uh, preclinical models for uh, alcohol use disorder. Um, and then sum up, and I wanna make sure I, I end in plenty of time for, uh, for some questions and, and discussion. So just to start off and get everyone on the same page, uh, talking about what are cannabinoids. They can generally come uh, in three flavors, and I'm gonna talk about the first two here. Um, the first group is, of course, natural cannabinoids. These are the molecules that come from plants, cannabis, sativa, indica, um, and the two predominant uh, cannabinoid species in terms of their chemical structures are shown below. The first one is uh, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. Um, and the second one most people have heard of at this point is cannabidiol or CBD shown here. Um, hopefully you can see that the pointer uh, of the mouse. There are, over, there are several hundred other molecules that come from these cannabinoid plants, uh, most of which we don't really understand a lot about in terms of their bioactivity, but are the topic of, of a lot of ongoing research. There are also uh, a group of cannabinoids that are synthetic. These are, um, as the term implies, developed in laboratory settings. Some of these were developed by pharmaceutical companies uh, looking to capitalize on some of the therapeutic um, potential of this system. Uh, others were generated as tool compounds that we can use in the laboratory to investigate cannabinoid receptor function, for example. Um, unfortunately, some of these have also been used um, in recreational products. There was a period about seven or eight years ago 
where synthetic cannabinoids were being marketed illicitly um, through the internet. Um, people were using them and there were uh, a lot of negative side effects that were um, emerging for people using these compounds, primarily because of their potency. Some of these are up to 100 times more potent than THC at activating uh, cannabinoid receptors. And thus um, that explains to a large degree um, uh, the large amount of uh, sort of adverse effects that are experienced by people that use these uh, synthetic molecules over, over natural products. Um, so our, our interest in cannabinoids and endocannabinoids and their role in anxiety really comes from looking at um, things like the reasons why people use cannabis. And if you ask people that chronically use marijuana some of the reasons why they do so, the top one, two, three reason um, are often cited as being reductions in anxiety, stress relief, tension relief, and more importantly, importantly um, stress coping motives are highly cited um, in people that use cannabis that have existing stress-related psychiatric disorders such as PTSD and other anxiety disorders. Um, and importantly, treatment of these types of disorders um, are frequently listed as indications um, for which people can receive medical cannabis in states where uh, it's legal. And if you look at more um, sophisticated analyses, you can see, for example, that uh, patients that have a lifetime diagnosis of PTSD are significantly more likely to report cannabis use and cannabis use disorder than patients that don't have um, a PTSD diagnosis. And in patients that have PTSD, uh, use of cannabis to cope with symptoms is highly cited relative to patients that don't have this type of disorder. And of course, wherever there's money to be made, people are capitalizing on this and you can actually purchase different types of cannabis that are marketed to help you cope with things like stress, for example, or to help you feel you know, more relaxed. So this is something that is um, commonly been known uh, for many decades, if not longer, um, that cannabis and certain types of cannabis um, can help certain people, at least with the perception of reducing anxiety and coping um, with adverse effects of, of stress. We also know from uh, clinical studies that when you block cannabinoid receptors with pharmacological agents, in this particular case, Ramonabond, which was uh, a, uh, a medication that was approved um, in Europe for the treatment of obesity, and it's a CB1 receptor antagonist. And the reason it's no longer used is because it caused significant increases in anxiety and depression and suicidality in subpopulations uh, of people that were taking this. And so we can see now that when you block this system, you actually can potentiate um, symptoms of anxiety, depression, um, whereas the slides I showed you previously suggest that activating this system with THC can actually have the opposite effect in that it can mitigate some of those effects. And human experimental studies have also shown that when you block CB1 receptors, that you can potentiate um, laboratory-based uh, anxiety measures, um, including anxiety and physiological responses like heart rate um, in response to an experimental stressor. So this system really seems to be important for dampening the effects of stress and reducing anxiety. Um, and that's mainly gleaned from these uh, clinical and epidemiological studies that I've, I've reviewed. Now the third class of cannabinoids, which I haven't mentioned yet, are so-called endocannabinoids or endogenous cannabinoids. And I have a little bit of a history here. People can sort of read these, but over the past 20 years or so, the biology and the pharmacology and the physiology of these lipids have been intensely studied in a wide variety of fields, um, all the way from obesity to cognition, emotion, um, sympathetic nervous system activity, feeding, um, and many other areas. And for this particular talk, I'm gonna focus on one molecule, 2 arachidonyl glycerol. Its synthetic and metabolic pathways are shown here. It's a lipid molecule that activates cannabinoid type 1 and 2 receptors in a similar way to THC. Um, it's synthesized by this enzyme diacylglycerol lipase from arachidonic acid containing diacylglycerol molecule. So there's a phospholipase C DAG lipase enzymatic cascade that results in the synthesis of this endocannabinoid. And it's degraded by an enzyme monoacylglycerol lipase into free arachidonic acid. 
And we and others have developed tools over the past decade or so to modulate both the synthesis and degradation of this molecule, allowing us to ask a lot of questions about its role in regulating stress reactivity. If cannabis um, and the use of cannabis associated with reductions in anxiety and improved stress coping, maybe this particular endogenous system has a physiological role in regulating these processes. And if we understand that, we might then be able to exploit this system for some therapeutic purpose. And that's really what I'm going to focus on in terms of the data we and others have been collecting over the past 10 to 15 years on this particular topic. So again, here is the synthetic pathway for two arachidonal glycerol. What we also know, as Roger mentioned, our lab and many others before us um, have put in a lot of time and effort into understanding what this signaling system does at the synapse. And so I'll just describe this um, as it'll come back um, later to be important in some of the data I'll show. Two arachidonal glycerol, in contrast to many canonical neurotransmitters like glutamate and GABA, monoamines, that are released in an anterograde fashion where they're preformed, packaged into vesicles, and released upon axonal depolarization. 2-AG is actually produced within postsynaptic cells. So its synthesis and its synthetic enzyme, diacylglycerol lipase, is located within dendritic spines and dendritic shafts. And calcium influx is a trigger that activates the enzyme and that produces 2-arachidonal glycerol. That molecule then leaves the postsynaptic cell, activates presynaptic cannabinoid receptors that are GIO-coupled GPCRs that, when active, reduce presynaptic neurotransmitter release probability. So it's a negative feedback system initiated by postsynaptic activity. And the degrading enzyme monoacylglycerol lipase is located uh, nicely within this presynaptic terminal such that after the receptor has been engaged by the lipid, it can then be degraded and the actions of the signaling system terminated. And so what does this actually look like physiologically? So there are two modes of signaling for 2-AG that have been elucidated. The canonical one is what's known as a phasic signal, and that's characterized by um, a depolarization-induced suppression, which is the bioassay people use um, electrophysiologically to measure 2-AG release. When we were to measure, for example, uh, glutamate AMPA-mediated currents on the postsynaptic neurons, um, we can see that after achieving a stable baseline, if we interleave a postsynaptic depolarization that opens calcium channels and allows calcium to come into the cell and release 2-AG, we see a transient suppression in the amplitude of that evoked response. And that can be blocked or abrogated largely in CB1 knockout mice, for example. And that is, of course, if you remove the receptor, 2-AG can't exert its presynaptic effect and you lose that transient phasic uh, 2-AG mediated synaptic depression. We can also do things like inhibit the enzyme that degrades 2-AG. And when you do that, you generally see a reduction in the frequency of spontaneous glutamatergic signaling and GABAergic signaling. And this suggests that there may be some constitutive release of this particular molecule that's constitutively activating the CB1 receptor and that when you gate degradation, you can um, change presynaptic release probability. Likewise, if you delete enzymes responsible for 2-AG synthesis, and here you can see um, that uh, when that happens in postsynaptic neurons, in this case, it's the prefrontal cortex, you can put excitatory synapses into a high release probability mode. And we measure that using the paired pulse ratio and a drop in that ratio indicates an increase in release probability. So again, that suggests that these molecules may be constitutively released and activating the presynaptic cannabinoid receptors to cause a tonic suppression of glutamate release. So there's both a phasic signal that's initiated by postsynaptic depolarization, and there may also be a constitutive or tonic release um, that's mediated by factors that we don't fully understand but might result in tonic suppression of neurotransmitter release at various synapses through this retrograde signaling system. And so I'm gonna talk about now um, the main conclusions first in sort of a summary slide and then walk through some of the data um, that allowed us to arrive at this conclusion. 
And the basic concept that we and others have put forth recently is that 2AG signaling, uh, when it's functioning optimally here, and you have this sort of green indicating high levels of 2AG signaling, we propose that you have low levels of anxiety, low stress reactivity, you can have optimal fear extinction and generalization, which we'll talk a little bit about, as well as reductions in the activity of neural circuits that are responsible for generating fear and anxiety-like states. In contrast, if you have low levels of this signaling system not working optimally, you can have the opposite phenotypes where you have maybe increases in stress reactivity, anxiety, and increased activity within particular neural circuits that are responsible for generating fear and anxiety-like states. So high levels of 2AG are protective and support physiological responses to stress, whereas low levels may predispose people to developing psychopathology in the face um, of environmental stressors, for example. And the corollary of that is that if we can find therapeutic approaches to enhance levels of 2AG, we might be able to rescue or remediate some of these adverse consequences of stress and uh, reduce them by elevating levels of 2AG. And this model might also explain why there's a high comorbidity between cannabis use and uh, people that suffer from certain types of stress-related disorders. And that if there is a deficiency in this endogenous signaling system, maybe people are using cannabis to help compensate or to cope with that deficiency and restore homeostasis in this signaling system. That, that's a hypothesis that requires um, more experimental evidence. Okay, so one of the things we can do um, to try and test this hypothesis, and which we did to test it, was to perform some very simple experiments. We can, for example, ask the question, if 2AG is important for mitigating the adverse effects of stress and reducing anxiety, what happens when we eliminate the signaling system? And so we can do that, for example, by inhibiting or deleting the enzyme that synthesizes 2AG. And so when we do that, okay, sorry about that. Um, using, in this particular case, um, DAG lipase knockout animals. And when we look at 2AG levels within these mice, you can see that they're very low compared to wild-type litter mates in all the areas that we're interested in, such as the prefrontal cortex um, and the amygdala. And when we ask very simple questions about the behavioral phenotype of these animals that have very low levels of 2AG within their brain, we can see that they have an anxiety-like phenotype. So this is a uh, behavioral assay um, where animals are asked whether they prefer to spend time in a light versus a closed or dark environment. Animals that spend more time in the light side of this light dark box, um, it's an indication of reduced anxiety-like behavior. <clears throat> and we can see that the knockout animals actually spend a lot less time uh, in the light and move around a lot less in that light area suggesting that they're avoidant. Um, and this is true in both male and female knockouts um, within the, the homozygote genotype, but not the, not the heterozygote. And so this is a very simple assay, but it speaks to the main conclusion that I mentioned in the previous slide, that a deficiency in this system is associated with heightened levels of anxiety, at least in these mouse models. Uh, we can do additional experiments, um, such as uh, fear conditioning and extinction. Uh, this is a behavioral assay that's relevant to psychiatric disorders like PTSD, for example. Um, this particular assay, mice are exposed to a foot shock that's paired with a tone. Uh, they form associative memories between the tone and the foot shock, such that presentation of that tone in a neutral context days later will result in a learned fear response, and we measure that by freezing behavior. And also, if those tones are presented non-contingently over a longer period of time, known as extinction training, those fear responses will be reduced. And of course, it's an impairment in that extinction process that represents one of the core aspects of the pathophysiology of PTSD. Patients cannot appropriately extinguish 
um, aversive trauma memories, even during appropriate psychotherapeutic um, interventions, for example. And so when we do a similar type of experiment, in this case, we look at our DAG lipase knockout animals, uh, we can see that their baseline freezing during this recall test is relatively normal. They're freezing to the initial tone onset, signaling that they've learned the association between the, the tone and the shock is pretty normal. However, their ability to reduce their freezing or extinguish that condition fear response is significantly blunted. And we can see this over several days of a particular experiment. So we now know that 2AG is important not just for reducing innate anxiety-like responses, but also for the physiological extinction of learned fear responses. Another core part of the pathophysiology of a disorder like PTSD is fear generalization. Patients with PTSD will often generalize trauma-related cues over time. So uh, an example might be that um, initially there were sounds of gunshots that were paired with life-threatening trauma. But over time, those environmental or auditory uh, stimuli generalize to now maybe any sort of loud tone or loud you know, noise, but eventually in extreme cases will generalize to any sort of large or high magnitude auditory uh, stimulation, and that becomes very debilitating. Uh, leads to a lot of avoidance behavior. People will not go into environments where there will be a lot of auditory stimulation, um, and that really uh, can be quite a debilitating part of that disorder. And so the generalization of these fear cues is something that's important to understand. And we've also shown that um, impairments in 2-AG signaling result in this type of generalization. So I'll walk you through this particular experiment where, as in the previous slide, animals are exposed to a tone that's paired with a shock. But now, 24 hours later, not only are they exposed to the tone that predicted the shock, they're also exposed to new tones that are slightly different. They're both auditory, but the frequency or the sort of the uh, the way the sound is generated might be slightly different. And so the data are shown here where after conditioning, and animals are, well, either treated before or after conditioning with an inhibitor of the enzyme, diacylglycerol lipase, which reduces 2-AG levels now within a few hours of treatment. And you can see that here where levels of 2-AG after drug administration are very low in all the brain areas that we're interested in. But behaviorally, what we see is that while vehicle-treated animals show large increases to the CS+, which is the tone that predicts the shock, they have significantly lower levels of freezing to novel tones that might have some similarities to the CS+, but are distinguishable. However, animals that don't have 2-AG signaling intact, either during the learning process or during the recall process, have problems distinguishing those novel tones from tones that actually predict danger. And you can see that they're showing high levels of freezing to both novel tones as well as threat predictive stimuli. So now we know that 2-AG is really required for the specificity of these fear memories. It's also important for the extinction of fear memories and it's important for um, the expression of innate anxiety. And deficiencies in these systems or deficiencies in this signaling molecule uh, promote pathological states in all of these areas that I've described. Um, one of the things we're doing and have done most recently is begun to try and understand maybe some of the neural correlates of this impairment in uh, discrimination or this enhanced fear of generalization. And so in this particular experiment, we were recording from prefrontal cortical neurons while animals were exposed to either novel tones or threat predictive stimuli and either treated with vehicle or the DAG lipase inhibitor DO34 here. And what you can see is that when animals are presented with novel tones or presented with threat predictive stimuli, the CS+, there are very different patterns of neural activity. That's obviously depicted here in these heat maps um, after clustering neurons into similar activity patterns. I don't wanna get bogged down in the details here, but what we can see is when we look in particular clusters of cells, for example, this particular pink cluster, 
that when we dissociate neurons um, that come from animals that have been treated with DO34 to inhibit DAG lipase and reduce 2-AG signaling relative to vehicle treated animals, we actually can see increases in activity in response to the novel tone, but similar responses to the condition stimulus. So again, this might represent a neural correlate that there are populations of cells that emerge that are more responsive to the novel tone and in fact responsive to both the novel tone and the CS when 2-AG signaling is impaired. And that might be a neural correlate of this impaired discrimination these animals are experiencing at the behavioral level. So we have a lot more analyses that we're working on in terms of these types of data sets, um, but this is one of the directions we're going in trying to understand population level coding that might be um, important for uh, how 2-AG signaling actually changes these behavioral phenotypes. All right. So all I've talked to you so far is sort of the bad news about what happens when you don't have this signaling system. Um, what about the good news? Well, a corollary hypothesis of our um, sort of basic model that I introduced earlier is that if we're able to enhance level of this signaling system, can we actually improve stress responsivity and potentially reduce innate anxiety-like behavior? And we can do that by inhibiting degradation of this particular molecule, um, tumor echidonal glycerol, by inhibiting this enzyme monoacylglycerol lipase. And when we do that, we see increases in uh, levels of 2-AG in the brain. And behaviorally, what we can see is that um, in this particular model, uh, when animals are exposed to an immobilization stress right before they're put into the same light-dark exploration box that I told you about before, uh, we can see that the animals that are exposed to stress spend a lot less time in the light. So this is an anxiety-like phenotype that is induced by the immobilization stress. And if we treat animals with increasing doses of this magalipase inhibitor, what you can see is a dose-dependent partial reversal of that phenotype. And so we can, uh, in theory, start to reverse stress-induced anxiety-like phenotypes by augmenting levels of this signaling system, uh, which again fits in with that basic concept that when you have high levels of this system, either innately or through some sort of pharmacological intervention, um, that might uh, be a protective factor and be able to mitigate some of the adverse effects of stress. Uh, we've done other experiments. I don't have time to go into the details of this, but there are paradigms, um, as uh, many of the folks at, uh, at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine know, that can distinguish between uh, animals that are susceptible um, and resilient to different types of um, stressful experiences in related to some behavioral phenotype. And this particular phenotype was a novelty-induced uh, hypophagia and the latency to consume a, a palatable shake. And what we can see is that some animals um, are highly susceptible and that their latency increases dramatically after stress exposure, for example. And there are large groups of animals that in fact do not change their behavior in response to stress. What we then were asking is, well, what does 2-AG do in terms of regulating this innate either stress responsivity or resilience or susceptibility? And we can see here, just looking at the proportions of animals that show a susceptible or resilient-like phenotype, we can dynamically modulate that by either increasing levels of 2-AG or decreasing levels of 2-AG pharmacologically. So, um, in, under normal conditions, we see anywhere from 25 to 33% of animals showing susceptibility to this particular foot shock stress. If we enhance levels of 2-AG during testing only, we can dramatically reduce that proportion. In contrast, if we inhibit 2-AG synthesis, we can dramatically increase the proportion of animals showing susceptibility um, in this particular behavioral assay. So not only can we affect the innate levels of uh, uh, anxiety, but we can also affect uh, whether animals will show a susceptible or resilient like phenotype by dynamically increasing or decreasing 2-AG signaling. So one of the things that we became interested in about three or four years ago was trying to understand some of the neural circuits by which 2-AG might be acting on 
to result in some of these behavioral phenotypes. And so we were searching for candidate neural circuits to interrogate. And one of the things that um, we started with was understanding where are these signaling components located. And it turns out that 2-AG synthetic enzymes as well as cannabinoid receptors are heavily expressed within limbic brain areas like the basal lateral amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex. And this is an area, and these are areas, and coupling within these areas have been associated um, with fear expression in humans. So work by Christian Grion and others at NIMH um, have dubbed this neural circuit uh, to be an aversive amplification pathway, for example, that co-activation of these areas is highest when people are exposed to threat um, or are experiencing negative affect associated with stress reactivity. And so we work with our, some collaborators here within our department that are very interested in anxious temperament and neural circuitry underlying anxiety disorders. And using a population of subjects that they had, they were able to show that uh, neural activity and neural coupling between the amygdala and dorsal aspects of the prefrontal cortex were indeed highest in people that were exposed to potentially threatening cues in a human fear conditioning paradigm. I'm not gonna go over all the details of that, but, but people that are exposed to ambiguous cues actually will rate those as being most anxiety provoking relative to cues that are certainly predictive of either safety or threat. And more importantly, the degree of coupling between the amygdala and the dorsal prefrontal cortex was correlated with trait anxiety. And this is a predictor or risk factor for affective psychiatric disorders, such as anxiety disorders and major depression, for example. And so the co-activation of these brain areas um, in response to unpredictive threatening stimuli um, being correlated to trait anxiety certainly added credence to the fact that this is an area or a circuit um, which might be important, um, might be an important substrate uh, by which cannabinoids might be acting to then affect stress-related behavioral phenotypes. And so uh, we know that the prefrontal cortex in mice is highly stress responsive. Um, we validated that in some models here showing that exposure again to foot shock um, causes activation of prefrontal cortical neurons. We can see this using single cell calcium imaging, but it's also been shown using FOSS expression and lots of other um, activity measures throughout the years. And in this particular experiment, what you can see is there are lots of different patterns of activity within the prefrontal cortex when animals are exposed to these aversive stimuli. There are groups of cells that are responsive to the shock itself when it starts. Uh, there are other groups of cells that are responsive to the termination of the stressor itself and such that when the shock ends, their activity begins to ramp up. But we also noticed that over time, these representations were relatively stable. So if you look at early, middle, and late exposures to this shock, and these are randomly delivered to the animal across about a 10 minute period, what we can see is that they're pretty much interleaved. And if you look at the principal component space, early, middle, and shock ensemble representations are basically overlapping. So the experience that animals are getting uh, is coded for by a very similar uh, population code across time. But when we actually look at what's happening in the prefrontal cortex and different neurons that are tracked across time, what you see is that those representations, while they're the same during the early and late representation, they're actually encoded for by different populations of cells. And this was somewhat surprising to us. So early in the shock presentation, this is the first two shocks, you see lots of prefrontal cortical neurons that respond to the shock onset. And then you have these later responding cells and these persistently responding cells. Interestingly, if you go to the uh, last two shocks, you see the same pattern of activity, early shock responsive, late shock responsive, and persistently responsive, but it's a completely different population of neurons. And so the advantage of this, of course, is that over time, there are large populations of cells that are increasing their activity to the shock, which allows potentially for them to participate in computational activities such as associative learning, 
um, why, you know, um, that the template, so to speak, or the available neurons uh, becomes larger and larger, uh, the more experiences this animal has. So that's a theory and those are things that we're, uh, we're investigating, but it was quite interesting when we actually looked at the cells over time. We also know that the basal lateral inputs to the prefrontal cortex are active during this shock experience. And so again, connecting the basal lateral amygdala to the prefrontal cortex, here we're imaging prefrontal cortex terminals arising from the amygdala, and you can see a large increase um, in response to uh, shock delivery. Um, and more importantly, we know that activation of this circuit in mice also is causally related to anxiety-like behavior. So we can use some intersectional dread approaches to activate BLA cells that project to the prefrontal cortex and show, for example, that the animals show anxiety-like phenotypes in the elevated plus maze. So now we know that in rodents, the prefrontal cortex is active. The basolateral amygdala inputs to the prefrontal cortex is active by this shock experience and activating these cells is causally related to the generation of persistent anxiety-like phenotypes. And so one of the things we wanted to do was try and understand how endocannabinoids might be regulating this pathway, this excitatory drive from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. And so we used a combination of optogenetics and uh, reporter systems. I'm not going to get into too much of the detail, but we're able to basically activate uh, basolateral cortex inputs to the prefrontal cortex and then record from neurons within the PFC. Um, and it's important to note that this particular experience that I was talking about, these random foot shocks that are given to the mouse over a period of about 10 minutes, results in a persistent anxiety-like phenotype measure 24 hours later, for example. And you can see that here in the amount of time animals are spending in the open arm being reduced uh, 24 hours after a shock experience compared to uh, control animals. And when we look synaptically at what's going on between the amygdala and the dorsal prefrontal cortex, what we see is that synapses after stress exposure um, are put into this high release probability state as measured by a reduction in the paired pulse ratio across different stimulation intensities. And the ability to trigger action potentials in prefrontal cortical neurons by BLA inputs is also enhanced after stress. So this is similar to work that, um, of course, Roger has done, Tom Cash and others have shown that uh, stress increases connectivity between the basolateral amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. And so now we have an animal model um, that recapitulates largely what, we, what people have seen in human neuroimaging studies that stressful stimuli associated with persistent anxiety-like phenotypes are associated with increased connectivity between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. We also wanted to know, of course, how do endocannabinoids fit into regulating this neural pathway? And so what we were able to show is that endocannabinoids are important for negatively regulating excitatory inputs from the basolateral amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. And we can see this in a number of ways. We can inhibit cannabinoid receptors or prevent 2-AG synthesis. Both of those manipulations result in increased release probability at BLA to PFC synapses. And this is just another way of showing that using asynchronous neurotransmitter release frequency. And I'm not gonna get into those details, but the take home is that endocannabinoids are very important for limiting glutamate release at BLA to PFC synapses. And so when we put these two things together, what we can see is that, again, as I showed you in the previous slide, animals that are exposed to stress here in red show higher release probability at BLA to PFC synapses. Again, either inhibiting cannabinoid receptors or preventing 2-AG synthesis also places these synapses into a high release probability state. But the effects of stress are then occluded. So stress has no further effect if we put in place these two manipulations. And more importantly, if you enhance levels of 2-AG, you can prevent this effect. So enhancing 2-AG is able to keep these synapses in a low probability state even after stress exposure. And so here we have a basic model 
whereby 2-AG released from prefrontal cortical neurons suppresses input from the basolateral amygdala tonically. And that results in a low anxiety behavioral state. After stress exposure, this 2-AG signaling system we think is compromised, which then contributes to the enhanced glutamate release from the BLA onto the prefrontal cortex. So our data suggests that this system that normally dampens down glutamate release from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex is compromised or broken after stress exposure. And that that breakdown of that system really contributes to the strengthening of the glutamate release between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. And then subsequently the high anxiety like state exhibited by these mice after stress exposure. And that lastly, when we enhance levels of 2-AG with this compound JZL184 that prevents the breakdown of 2-AG and elevates 2-AG levels, we can restore synaptic suppression, reduce drive from the BLA to the prefrontal cortex, and also reduce anxiety-like behavior after stress. And so the last thing we did was to conclusively sort of nail down the importance of the amygdala inputs to the prefrontal cortex in being important for endocannabinoid regulation of stress-induced anxiety, we deleted cannabinoid receptors selectively from basolateral amygdala inputs to the prefrontal cortex. And in doing that, uh, we were able to show that this very selective circuit-specific manipulation actually results in a synaptic phenotype very similar to stress. Remember, stress increases uh, or uh, causes BLA synapses to the prefrontal cortex to be put into this high release probability state. And if we delete cannabinoid receptors selectively from this pathway, we can actually recapitulate that at the synaptic level by measuring the paired pulse ratio and showing that there's a reduction in that ratio in animals that have this circuit specific deletion. And more importantly, this very selective inhibition or deletion of cannabinoid receptors from this pathway also behaviorally mimics the effects of stress. And we can see that these animals are spending much less time in the open parts of an elevated plus maze. And so again, this gets us back to the basic concept that when you have low levels of 2-AG signaling, you have increases in connectivity between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. So there's a collapse of this signaling system at glutamate synapses from the amygdala to the PFC. And we have now provided some causal evidence that that collapse of that 2-AG signaling system actually is important for driving persistent anxiety-like states after stress exposure. So I'm going to spend maybe the next five minutes or so talking about the second half of um, uh, the, the talk, and now it's turned into the sort of the second five minutes, uh, but it'll be very quick because the basic concept is quite simple. Um, it has been shown in clinical trials that inhibiting cannabinoid receptors um, has uh, anti-addictive effects, can reduce, for example, um, smoking in patients that um, want to stop using tobacco. This drug was never actually clinically approved for that, but there's many, many, many preclinical studies that have shown that blocking cannabinoid receptors uh, will reduce drug intake. And this is some of that data specifically for alcohol, um, showing that, for example, CB1 blockade reduces drinking microstructure associated with alcohol-liking behavior. And in human experimental studies, uh, there are suggestions that Ramonabond or the CB1 antagonist can actually reduce the number of drinks people consume in human laboratory studies. And it's also important to note that 2-AG release within the nucleus accumbens is initiated by alcohol consumption. So these are rat microdialysis studies showing that when animals um, drink alcohol, you can see increases in 2-AG being released within the nucleus accumbens and that the levels of 2-AG or the amount of 2-AG that's released is proportional to the amount of alcohol that's administered. So we tested a very basic hypothesis that if 2-AG released by alcohol is important for driving alcohol consumption, if we inhibit 2-AG synthesis, can we reduce alcohol consumption? And I'll just show a few slides, um, basically giving the take-home message here that if we look at voluntary 
voluntary two bottle of choice alcohol consumption in wild type or DAG lipase knockout animals that don't produce 2-HG, for example, you can clearly see very large reductions in alcohol preference over time, as well as alcohol consumption in both male and female mice. So not having 2-AG does reduce alcohol consumption. We can do this pharmacologically where uh, these are now wild type animals that have three or four day treatments with an inhibitor of DAG lipase and we see the same effect where you can treat animals acutely, 2-AG levels drop and you can see a rapid drop in alcohol preference and alcohol consumption um, in both male and female animals. Um, while we do not see concomitant reductions in things like sucrose preference, for example. So we can inhibit 2-AG synthesis either genetically or pharmacologically and reduce alcohol consumption without affecting uh, consumption of natural rewards uh, like sucrose. Uh, we also see similar effects in aversion resistant drinking uh, models. So this is where alcohol is devalued by addition of quinine and animals that persist in their alcohol consumption despite this devaluation also reduce their consumption when treated with the inhibitor of DAG lipase. Um, I'll skip this and go to the last slide here, which is based on the previous data by uh, the late Larry Parsons, again, showing that the amount of 2-AG released within the nucleus accumbens is proportional to the amount of alcohol animals are given. And if 2-AG release within the nucleus accumbens is really a signal for driving alcohol consumption, we should be able to reduce 2-AG synthesis specifically within the nucleus accumbens and reduce voluntary alcohol intake. And so to do that, we used our flock CB uh, DAG lipase knockout animals and injected Cre bilaterally within the nucleus accumbens. And as you can see from the data here, at least initially in our first cohort of subjects, we can see a reduction in voluntary alcohol consumption simply by reducing 2-AG synthetic capacity within the nucleus accumbens. And that again fits with the microdialysis studies showing this relationship between alcohol-induced 2-AG release and the amount uh, of alcohol. So I think this is some of the first evidence that specifically modulating one particular endocannabinoid ligand, 2-AG for example, is able to reduce voluntary alcohol consumption in a variety of models um, that are suggestive of clinical efficacy. And so clinically used compounds such as naltrexone, for example, that's approved for alcohol use disorder, show very similar things in the types of animal models that I've shown you before, um, suggesting that this might be uh, a promising therapeutic. Um, of course, there's a lot more work that needs to be done um, before these types of compounds um, are moved into clinical trials. Um, I'm going to end here, but just to let people know, one of the things that we are interested in is trying to understand mechanistically how these particular molecules might be reducing alcohol consumption. And we know that uh, VTA dopamine neuron activity um, is important for the rewarding aspects of all drugs of abuse, including ethanol. Um, and one of the things that ethanol does is reduce GABAergic uh, release onto VTA dopamine neurons. And you can see that here just in the black traces that when we add ethanol and record from VTA dopamine neurons, uh, GABAergic transmission is reduced. And one of the things we think that's doing is facilitating dopamine neuron activity. In the presence of the DAG lipase inhibitor, we lose that effect, suggesting that 2-AG is released by dopamine neurons to suppress GABA and facilitate dopamine neuron firing when alcohol is on board. And if we can prevent that inhibition in GABA, that might suggest that dopamine activity is being kept low. And that might be some of the underlying mechanism by which alcohol um, drinking and consumption is suppressed uh, when we reduce 2-AG synthesis pharmacologically or genetically. And so I just wanna uh, acknowledge all the works uh, that's gone into this. Um, a lot of the stress work uh, the calcium imaging and the cir circuit specific analyses were done by Dave Marcus, uh, Becca Blewett, and uh, Luis Rosas Vidal, that's in the lab now. And all the alcohol work um, that I showed you briefly was done by uh, postdoc in the lab, Gaura Betsy, and graduate student uh, in the lab, Nathan Winters. And um, all of our funding that have allowed us to uh, do this work 
and I hope we'll have about 10 minutes left for questions. Hey, thanks a lot, uh, Session. That was a fantastic talk. So I'm going to ask uh, anyone who has a question to um, raise your hand, and um, I can unmute you one by one. Um, but while you're thinking of a question, I can ask one. Um, so um, it, it's first of all, it's really amazing how how profound the effects of 2AG are in virtually every behavioral assay that you've looked at. One of the things that popped up, um, or that's that's really interesting for me, is the um, uh, that's this breakdown of resilient versus susceptible animals following stress. Um, I, I wonder if you could comment on whether you think the cannabinoid system plays a role in that in those individual differences, or is there something happening at the at the cellular level? Um, for example, um, we, you know we know that that 2-AG is released, um, it's a diffusible messenger, and, um, and it can act on both excitatory and inhibitory cells. So it is one possibility that um, there's a bias in terms of which cell populations are being modulated in particular individuals. Yeah, so I can answer the second part of that question a little bit more definitively. We believe that uh, 2-AG signaling at um, glutamate synapses is probably more important for reducing um, anxiety and some of these stress-related consequences. So that's been shown using uh, glutamate versus GABA-specific CB1 knockout animals, as well as some of the work we've done showing that um, disruption of CB1 receptors on, you know, specifically glutamate neurons is sufficient to recapitulate, you know, some of the effects of stress behaviorally. The resilient susceptible um, thing is uh, a little bit more complicated. You know, one question is, is there really an underlying difference in 2-AG signaling that contributes to these differential behavioral phenotypes? Um, and so we were able to actually show uh, some evidence for that where animals that were resilient to stress actually had enhanced phasic 2-AG release at hippocampal amygdala inputs, for example. So that might suggest that uh, an enhancement in synaptic signaling, at least at those glutamate uh, inputs, is associated with the phenotype. Doesn't mean that they're causally related to that phenotype but at least associated. And we were able to see differences in the signaling system in those two populations. What we weren't really able to do, partly for technical reasons and um, uh, to some degree because we just didn't have time, was to see if we, there was something measurable before the animals were exposed to stress in this system that would predict. And we just didn't have the tools at that time to do that. We now have things like endocannabinoid biosensors that we can use in vivo without having to take brain slices, that will allow us to answer some of these questions. So that, that of course, is, um, are things that we're very interested in. Okay, we have a question from Anissa. Okay, Sashin, can you hear me? Yep. Hi. <laughs> uh, so actually I have a following question uh, on uh, Roger's question, which is, have you, like measured the uh, levels of DAG lipase or MAG lipase in your susceptible and um, uh, resilient animals. I know that you cannot do it before because of course you have to, right. uh, yeah? yeah. And my second question is, um, if we think about like clinical trials with MAG lipase uh, inhibitors, do you think that a chronic treatment with MAG lipase inhibitors can desensitize uh, CB1 receptors after a certain time? Um, so the second question is easier to answer. We know that's true in animal models um, and it's quite dose dependent. So the more 2-AG that's being released, uh, more desensitization occurs. And we also know that that's heterogeneous. It doesn't equally affect all synapses. There are some synapses that seem to be quite resistant to desensitization and downregulation and others that are more susceptible. 
So um, if these compounds are used, it's going to be a dose dependent and the heterogeneity or the differential downregulation might result in some very interesting phenotypes. So if you're only de desensitizing a subpopulation of receptors in particular circuits, what's left is going to give you a, quite a, an imbalance sort of in, in what those residual active receptors are going to be doing. So we don't know a lot about that, but we do know it's heterogeneous and it does occur, but is also dose dependent. And at relatively lower doses, we actually don't, don't see that desensitization. So that could be okay. important in the context of an overdose or something like that. Uh, we did look at almost everything in terms of CD1 receptor, dagolite-based expression, dagolite-based expression after classifying animals and doing post-mortem studies. And the bottom line is we really didn't find anything um, that was measurable at the biochemical level that distinguished between phenotypes. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question is from Hero. Hi, it's a great talk. Um, I wanted to follow up the conversation you had with Roger about the effect of uh, the uh, uh, CB1 receptor. So, um, you know, PFC, there's a lot of expression, especially internal. When you said about selective manipulation, are, are you talking about presynaptic side and the subcortical side or the uh, postsynaptic side? I just want to clarify. So in terms of the deletion experiment that we did, um, we were specifically deleting the cannabinoid receptor from the amygdala neurons that project to the prefrontal cortex. So they right. would be gone in the terminal, excitatory terminals in the prefrontal cortex would no longer have them. You would still have prefrontal CB1 receptors arising from other limbic inputs like the ventral hippocampus as well as the interneurons. I see, I see. So those are all still intact in the manipulation that we did. I see. So in that case, I'm curious if there's any contribution on the PFC postsynaptic side of the CB1 um, in this anxiety-related behavior, or, or everything can be explained postsynaptically, the CB1. So most of the functional CB1 is all presynaptic. So in terms of the synaptic effects, the localization at the terminal is really what di dictates their function. But there's only been one or two papers that have suggested postsynaptic uh, function of the receptor or somatically express function. And one of those might be to activate inwardly rectifying potassium channels and cause hyperpolarization. So yes. that, that's mm -hmm. one somatic effect that people know about. Um, we didn't really examine that and our manipulations that we did in the behavioral paradigm I was describing would not have affected that postsynaptic pyramidal cell CB1 expression. So we don't know the contribution of that or what the CB1 on the interneurons is doing in this model or in regulating right. stress response. We haven't looked at that yet. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Uh, okay, next question from Paul. There we go, hi. Hello. Oh, great talk, I really enjoyed hearing it. Um, my, my question has to do with um, the very interesting data that you showed with the firing patterns in the prefrontal cortex and how that seemed to change. The pattern was the same, but the neuron that would uh, fire in that particular way would change from the short to the late. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's really uh, two kind of related questions. So, so one is, um, have you looked to see whether the ones that are short are sort of a transient um, uh, change in their properties. So like they, you know, if you, you looked like immediately after you'd see that they fired in a particular way, but you know, seven days, 14 days later, they don't. Whereas the late ones are more persistent like that. So I'm thinking like, is it encoding? Like, do you get this initial response that's sort of then distributed for a long-term memory? I guess yeah. that's a better yeah, way. So I, I can't give you the answer, but I can tell you we're, we've done the experiment. So what we did was, um, <laughs> you know, the initial concept that we thought was that all the cells are, you know, we have a group of cells that will fire in these different patterns and those same cells will fire every time the animal is shot. Right. And that explains all the data. Right. Except when you look on a trial by trial basis, that's not the case. It's, it's a wandering spatial ensemble that's, that's activated early versus late versus middle. 
And so what we did was we now, we have a data set where we exposed animals that same stress over three days and are monitoring the same cells across all three days. And so that might get at a little bit of what you're talking about. In right. terms of, is one population more stable? Do we go to the front of the batting order, so to speak, that at some point those first cells will become active again, maybe on day two or day three? Right. Um, you know, because you have a limited number of neurons that are eligible, you know, um, <laughs> partly it's a technical issue. We only can limit a number of cells we're recording from, but also the brain has a finite number of cells. So if you keep exposing the animal to stress, at some point will you go back to that first ensemble or will it never happen? You'll always right. be encoding separate neurons to form that cluster. So those are all questions that we're very interested in answering based on that one figure that just kind of blew my mind that why isn't this the same group of cells that's responding every time? Right. Um, and actually it's a completely different set of cells that's responding and what that means and how can we understand that better. So well, hopefully we'll have that in the next few weeks. So it's really interesting. So then how do you think that this change in synaptic strength kind of maps onto those neurons? Do you think that's also going to be dynamic or? Um, yeah, so I think that, I, I didn't show this, but we also have similar data with fear conditioning where our cells are basically learning associations between shocks and tones. And we, I didn't talk about that, but it's a very similar concept that you never see the same population twice which is very anti to a lot of current thinking. But um, there have to be synaptic rules, I believe, that are going to explain this sort of roaming ensemble, right? So you could imagine concepts like long-term depression coming into play, right. where you have a set of neurons that's activated very early, somehow synaptically, LTD is induced such that when that same stimulus arises, that particular set of cells can no longer be activated. But another set that hasn't seen that stimulus before will be. And so long-term depression could prevent that first ensemble from being activated during later presentations of the shock, for example. So then if we say maybe that LTD is related to endocannabinoid synaptic suppression, Maybe if we block 2AG signaling, would we see a deterioration of that spatial wandering ensemble? Would you now expand that? So those are all things that we can we can test and are just are just super interesting. Yeah, very exciting. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're running out of time, but we'll take one one last question um, because it's coming from Yasmin. Thanks. Thanks so much, Roger. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, actually, Paul raised one of the questions I had, but then I'll add a second one because I do think it's so fascinating. So she, great talk as usual, and always something provocative. That you Thanks, do. great to see you. And um, so it comes back to the, the sex differences in regard to stress sensitivity. Have you guys start to yet parcel out anything in this regard, especially given the interesting results you're getting? Um, we, we have not seen anything like, you know, that blew our minds in terms of this is different between males and female mice that we've done. So that it's, it's both good and bad, right? It's good in the sense that most things that we're studying are relatively generalizable across at least male and female mice. At least for those circuits. So that's really interesting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And for the things that we've seen. Now, there are some subtle differences, like the collapse of the BLA to PFC circuit in males seems to be a little bit stronger than in females. Um, but again, quantifying that difference becomes quite difficult. We have, you know, we published all of this recently, and there are some subtle differences, but nothing where we could say, wow, this is you know, this is something that we need to investigate in terms of the sex dependent mechanistic differences. Most of the things we've seen so far, and even in the alcohol data, if anything, the females show, show stronger effects. So female mice are known to drink more alcohol in some of these paradigms. So a lot of what we do simply focuses on them and the males are sort of like, okay, it does that too. Um, but again, even in those experiments, we've seen basically the same things in both sexes. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Great talk. Good to see you. Okay.
Um, thanks again, Sachin, for a, a great talk. See you later. All right. Thank you, everyone.